Welcome back to the Sip and Peace podcast. Today we're talking Trader Joe's and specifically the fall seasonal items at Trader Joe's. And you can see I have my fall seasonal shirt on. What do you think about that, Tara? Looks very different from all your other flannels, which are also could be fall seasonal. The ones that I have for my cooking videos, I don't want to get dirty. So these are like the ones maybe that I wear out. This is the one you don't want to get dirty. That's right. Yeah. No, the cooking video ones, they actually act as aprons. That's right. That's right. And that's why they're kind of on the dark side, like that darker blue flannel, because when you get, you know, there's they're black and blue. When you get some uh, sauce or something on there, you can't even see. I'm going to jump right into a question right now. Okay. It's not an audience question, although I'm sure it's on their minds. Do you wear anything other than flannel? Yes, I do. I I just somebody just found um, a few people recognize me because I'm famous. They recognize me at Pottery Barn out east in Long Island. It was uh, multiple people in one day, and I had a T-shirt on that day, so they got to see me oh, in a T-shirt. I don't even remember. Were you wearing a T-shirt? I was. Oh wow. Yeah. Lucky for them. Yeah. <laughs> suns out, guns out. Huh? That's right. Yeah. Suns out, bellies out. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so enough enough of that. Let's uh, get into it right now. So Trader Joe's is known for their their seasonal finds, right? I mean, it's kind of like for us, not so much you because you don't really go there with me. But every year when when the air starts getting a little bit cooler, Sammy and I get really excited about going to Trader Joe's because we want to see if there's any new fall things, but we also know that those tried and true fall food items specifically are going to be there. And it's going to be an exciting time when we get it. It's just going to make everything great. I, I think it's exciting for a lot of people. I, I do. I think that's part of the allure of Trader Joe's. Mm -hmm. Seasonality is huge at Trader Joe's, probably bigger than any other store as far as I can think. Food, supermarket, Costco, really anything. Trader Joe's, their business is really a huge part of their business is selling seasonal items. Like they rotate the shelves because the stores are so small, they're constantly rotating what they have. They can't fit everything in one store. And I think that almost works to their advantage too. I mean, I think part of their business model is is kind of founded on that seasonality concept. Kind and scarcity. Of, I was going to say, yeah. it creates that that feeling of scarcity where you're like, if I don't get it, if I don't get this pumpkin pancake mix right now and buy like three or four boxes of it, guilty, done that, Yeah, I'm not going to be able to get it for a whole other year. Well, yeah, and they run out and then they stop. It won't be there anymore. So it could be a limited run. So maybe you have to go to the another, another Trader Joe's to find it. It could also be where some person goes in there, and I'm not naming any names, who ends up buying 30 of one particular item. That's not me. It wasn't you, but do you remember when we saw the mother yes. load at okay. that person's house yes. that time? I'm not going to mention <laughs> yes. their name because I think they watched this, but I opened this cabinet. It was in their basement, and this person purported to make everything homemade, and I opened the cabinet, and there was about 40 of their fall harvest sauce, which I will talk about that one in a minute. I don't, I'm don't. i not a big fan of. I know Tara likes it. That's on my list of items we're yeah. going to talk about but later. But I mean, it looked like this person, this person just cleared it out, cleared out a local Trader Joe's. <laughs> hey, no judgment. We're talking fall items here. And again, Trader Joe's, pumpkin spice, they kind of go hand in hand. But believe it or not, Trader Joe's isn't isn't the company that's responsible for the pumpkin spice craze, right, Tara? Yeah, and actually, so we do talk about this in a Patreon podcast episode where the whole episode is dedicated to pumpkin spice. I think, what did we title it? What, w, pump, oh, WTF yeah. is pumpkin spice? No, no, I titled it the pumpkinization of America. Oh, okay. The pump, yeah. Now, I wanted to call it WTF is <laughs> So listen, we're just we're just telling you because we already we already discussed this on there, but we're gonna we we want to go over it a little bit again right now. Yeah, what we found when we did our little bit of research on the topic. You're always guaranteed a little bit of research when you tune into the well, sipping piece podcast. I do podcast. like to fact check some things. I don't want to, you know, I had a hypothesis and the hypothesis turned out to be correct. Humans 
basically love to be reminded of fall because fall kind of creates those feelings of home, maybe turning inward a little bit, being with your family, nostalgia. You know that the holidays, like the the Christmas holidays, Jewish holidays, etc., you know that they are around the corner once fall passes. So fall kind of creates this cozy feeling in all of us. And according to this gentleman, cozy, yes, Matt Johnson, who is a psychologist specializing in marketing psychology, he says that pumpkin spice flavor triggers all of those feelings. So pumpkin spice doesn't always have pumpkin in it. It's usually the spices that are associated with pumpkin pie. So like allspice, clove, cinnamon, sometimes ginger, nutmeg, you know, any combination yeah. of those ingredients, those kind of trigger those feelings. And as Jim mentioned, it was not Trader Joe's that kind of started this craze. It really can be attributed to Starbucks. Yeah. In 2003, when they released their pumpkin spice latte, and that essentially kick-started the pumpkin spice craze that endures to this day. Again, we spoke about more about it, but Starbucks market capitalization probably prior to pumpkin spice latte coming out was probably under $10 billion company. Now they're a $100 billion market capitalization. Obviously, there's other factors involved for their success over these last 20 years, and it has been 20 years now since 2003 we're talking. They did that, and then you started seeing the beer coming on into into you know your distributors and into your stores a couple years later. It wasn't that you know, the tail wagging the dog, essentially, it's, you know, Starbucks started it all. Mm -hmm. And now you can't find a beer company or really any company that doesn't have a pumpkin spice product. That's right. So again, that's, that's more there. I think now let's just get back into Trader Joe's. Yeah. And before we start even going down this path, similar to Costco, we are not sponsored in any way by Trader Joe's. So these opinions are completely our own. Yeah, damn right we're not sponsored. I don't even really like Trader Joe's, all right? <laughs> I do. I, that's part of the dynamic here that we have going on today. Yeah, we're gonna have which, a spirited yeah, we'll have discussion spirited, here. Spirited debate. And so before we get into the actual items in Trader Joe's, I just wanna state a couple facts about it. And you know, I have it bulleted here, but it's, it's apparent to, I think even to the, you know, casual observer of, of these stores, Trader Joe's are small. They are small, tiny. They're like stores built for people that live in a tiny house almost. Their average store, and I looked it up, is 10,000 square feet in America. Your average supermarket, and this is just the moderate sized supermarkets. These aren't like the mega supermarkets. Average store for them is about 45,000 square feet. So, you, you know, you're talking like a third or qu quarter of the size. And in my experience, supermarkets are even bigger than that. Uh, the ones that we have here are about seven or eight times the size of a Trader Joe's. Would you agree with that? Yeah. I, I typically, I, so. I, I often see like, you'll see like a vacancy and for a supermarket, it'll be like 70,000 square feet available. Mm. Trader Joe's, 10,000 square feet. So Trader Joe's simply cannot have the size of and variety of things that a supermarket has. And- that's part of my thing that I'm not too big a fan of the place because I feel like you can't get everything done there. It's really, in my opinion, the place is meant for a single individual living in an apartment or maybe maybe you have a newborn. So maybe it's like three people in the family, get a couple things at Trader Joe's. But I'm always like, when, we, when, when Tyra gets something, I end up eating the whole box of whatever it is. And I'm like, okay, this would have been great if it was four times the size, you know, mm -hmm. because then, then the kids could have had some. Or- <laughs> <laughs> or vice versa, it, it it's often uh, my daughter who's eating all the, all the items, and I don't and I don't get to have any of mm -hmm. it. Yeah. Well, to be fair, she did come and help shop for it. So you can't do most of your regular shopping there. That's my contention. You might disagree with me. You might say, Jim, I get all my regular shopping done there. I find that hard to believe because even their shopping carts are about half the size of your typical shopping cart at a regular grocery store. Everything is just smaller there. In fact, their parking lots are smaller. So mm -hmm. I looked that up as well. The spacing between the parking spot lines is smaller. Is that meant to, de to deter like your F-150 driver or your Suburban? I don't know. I mean, there's definitely a method to the madness of the lots that Trader Joe's is picking. By us, they're typically in a strip mall, like an old strip mall. Mm -hmm. Maybe there was a Borders that 
that's a comp book bookstore for for you youngins who that went out of business, you know, about what ten years ago, and maybe uh, Circuit City parking lot too. They, basically, they kind of like take over where the old big box stores were. Yeah, and the then, one by us. There's a Bed Bath and Beyond, which is closed or closing in that parking lot, and that's another company that's yeah, going to go out of business yeah. or so is going out of business. It, I think it is. Yeah, that that location is is closed. I'm trying to think because when we lived in Minnesota too, that was also in a strip mall. It's always the same. Yeah, I yeah. looked it up. They said it, it, it's the same thing everywhere in America. Mm -hmm. And you know, there's not a lot of these places in America yet. They have a very loyal following. So I believe there's only 500, roughly 500 stores in America. I actually did read too that the average size of new Trader Joe's stores that are opening are much larger. So that comes down to everything getting larger and mm -hmm. you know bigger, super sized in America. Yeah. So they're probably tr they're probably as a company needing to adapt a little bit to that. Well, that's the thing. I don't, you know, for anybody who listens to this, you know, I'm constantly saying I can't, I don't have one store that I can go to to buy everything for all of the needs of our business, which is cooking. So. I usually shop at a combination of different stores. It's usually Costco, Whole Foods, Uncle Giuseppe's, Meat Farms. Rarely do I get anything at Trader Joe's that's for the Sip and Feast business. I go to Trader Joe's for my own personal satisfaction because I enjoy going there. The people who work there, I think, enjoy working there because they always seem to be in a good mood. That's, it's, I agree with it's that. One thing that I loved that they did in Minnesota that they don't do here was they had a stuffed animal. It was a walleye fish and his name was Wally. And the kids were little when we lived there. So what they would do, the staff, they would move Wally to different spots every day. So when the little kids came in, they would have to find Wally and they would tell the cashier on the way out. The cashier would say, did you guys find Wally today? And they would say, yeah, like James was so cute in his little voice. He'd be like, yeah, while he was by the frozen food or yeah. whatever. And it was so cute. And it was just an enjoyable experience going there. So I I feel like it's almost like the Disney world of. <laughs> See, Tara loves this the, place. It's almost like the Disney world of the grocery stores because they're trying to, in my opinion, create a better more pleasurable experience. Let me, we're going on a lot about this here, but it is important. Uh, my experience, again, and this is just my experience, so I might be wrong. Trader Joe's obviously has the data on this. I would think that 75% of the people, 75% 70, of the shoppers in that store that go into a Trader Joe's in any given month or year are women. Do you agree with that? I never see men in there. I mean, very rarely do I see a lot of men in those stores. I don't and, know. You know, again, that could be like, confirmation bias th that I'm suffering from. Yeah. But yeah, I, I don't see a lot. Ver uh, contrast that with Costco. I see it. I see probably more men than women. There's definitely, there's definitely men that shop there. It probably is more, I would say more women. I almost I feel like know. the branding and everything. I, I know you say it's for like single people, but I think it is. I think there are a lot of parents that shop there who have little kids. I think a lot of the products are targeted towards kids. I see men and women when I work there and same with the employees. It looks pretty, pretty evenly divided. The last thing I'll say is the store that I like that's similar to it. I actually like Aldi better than Trader Joe's. You know that I always preferred I felt like Aldi, the, the portions were larger, mm -hmm. and I felt like I could probably get most of the uh, shopping done there. I think Aldi has probably better values. Aldi doesn't, to me, doesn't have that same feeling. So yeah. when I go to Trader Joe's, I know I'm going to get an experience. Yeah. I don't feel like going to Aldi gives me that that same feeling. Tara's right. So Tara, tell us about your experience, and we're going to talk about Tara's, you know, Tara's what, top 10? I don't know if it's 10, well, but I'm going to go through some of my favorite things. And you're going to tell me when you've had them, if you like them, or I'm going to remind you that you did like them. And I'll, I'll just say some of the ones that I tried that maybe I wouldn't, I wouldn't buy again. First on my list, pumpkin ravioli. I actually really like their pumpkin ravioli. They're, you know, orange colored. I think they use natural coloring like a natto. Um, they're filled with cheese, pumpkin, and pumpkin spice. And I like them because they 
make a really quick and easy dinner. You can make it with a sage brown butter sauce, which is super simple. We actually have for our butternut squash gnocchi recipe on the website that has a sage brown butter yeah, sauce. Yeah, simple. So you could just, use that yeah. if you if you pick up some pumpkin ravioli. Um, and they also do make a gluten free version of the ravioli, which I have not tried. But I would say that as far as ravioli goes, they're great, and they're in the refrigerated section. They're not like a shelf stable ravioli so they're fresh do have i had these before in minnesota you did okay we I, I used to go there all the time in minnesota it was very easy to get to yeah it's a little it's a little more difficult everything's more difficult yeah, yeah. long island is big it has more population than most states in america and it's just a little island ravioli i agree with tara as long as it tastes good and i take her word for it that it tastes good ravioli is one of the best things to buy and not make Making ravioli does not really go with the year 2023 and where everybody's in, you know, the point in our lives. Ravioli is a long, time-consuming process, no matter how fast of a pasta maker you are, because when you make your pasta, you got to let it sit, you got to let it rest, then you're going to roll the, you know, you're going to do your sheets, and you got to have, you got to have a massive worktop, you know, you have your uh, damp towels over everything, then you're doing them, you're pressing them, you're like, oh no, I got air in my ravioli, they're going to open up. And then in the end, your kids are going to eat those raviolis that you, that you uh, slaved over for seven hours, just as fast as they are, or slow as the Trader Joe's ones. So I do like to buy ravioli in the store, and I doubt you're going to see a uh, ravioli made on our channel, our cooking channel. Well, never say never. All right, next on my list, don't hate me for this, is their autumnal harvest creamy pasta sauce. So this is something that I haven't bought really since we've been back in New York, but I did used to buy it all the time in Minnesota. I used to use it with pasta, but I would also saute ground turkey to kind of make like I don't want to call it a bolognese because it's not, but more like a turkey meat sauce. And this sauce isn't just made with tomato because I don't I don't like jarred tomato sauce, period, and don't use it. This has tomatoes, pumpkin, and butternut squash. And I really did enjoy that sauce. I didn't. <laughs> I am not a fan of this product. It tastes extremely artificial to me. To be honest with you, it reminds me of some of the sauces when we had the vodka sauce taste test. Oh, yeah. That video. Well, I didn't like those, but I do like the tr I do like the Trader Joe's sauce. And now the ground turkey idea, was that like an expo they were doing in a store one day to give you an idea or was that your idea to add that in no, there? No, I would use, we would get like the frozen squares of ground turkey from Costco. It was an easy thing for me to make when I got home from work. I would just take out the turkey while still frozen, essentially. Yeah. You know what? I, I admit I'm inherently biased for jarred sauce. Like I don't like any jarred sauce. I feel bad when I use it. Now you would, Jim, you were just saying you use ravioli made by people. I don't think it's an apples to apples comparison. I really feel like garbage when I use jarred sauce and not a fan of any of them, really. Even the regular marinara we did when I think it was Victoria, right? And Rayo's got mm -hmm. high scores. Those sauces still were nowhere near as good as making your own. And really, that's the case. This sauce, I'm not a big fan of. So I, I usually agree with you. I don't like jarred sauce. But this one, I give it a pass because it's not just tomatoes. It also has butternut squash and pumpkin in it, which to make a sauce with all of that would be a little bit more complex. Try it out. Maybe maybe you agree with Tara and you're like, Jim, you're this is better than anything you've ever made. It's good in a pinch and it's for fall, so it's fun. Move it on. <laughs> okay, pumpkin pancake mix. I have never tried the regular version. I've only bought the gluten-free because the first time I bought it, it was the gluten-free version. I brought it home. I made it. You, the kids, nobody said anything about it not tasting like it was missing gluten. Um, and everybody loved it. And the batter is really, really easy to work with. I mean, you I think it's an, an egg, some water, and oil that you mix with it. But for some reason, the pancakes are really easy to flip. It just comes together more easily than homemade pancake batter. Well, if you want to make... And it's pumpkin flavored. So it's it's really good. 
if you want to make pancakes the easy way, just make sure you're using a flat griddle. Don't mm-hmm. use a pan. It's yeah. you know it's hard to that get helps. your spatula underneath there. Yeah. I agree with Tara in this one. I kind of like these. I, I know she's going to say. Kind of? Yeah. You've been known to eat like 10 plus of them. <laughs> I would say it's more than kind of. Yeah, but again, 10 plus, how many? You're really going to make 10 out of a box there? They're probably like, those are probably like, what do they call Nickel paint? What are they? What are they? Silver dollar. Silver dollar. I'm like. <laughs> <laughs> you um, like them. Yeah. Especially no, when I add chocolate chips to them. They're really good. Yeah, chocolate chips is the perfect com- like com- contrast for pumpkin anything. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So that's a win-win from both of us. The next item I do not love. This is the first year I've seen them. I don't know if this is the first year they've come out, but they are pumpkin overnight oats. I love overnight oats. In fact, I usually will make them homemade, but these were not good. They tasted like weirdly tangy. I don't know, maybe... Maybe the batch I got was not good. I took one bite and I made like a really like like a face and Sammy was like, oh, that's not good. She knew by my face that I didn't like them. Did you see what ingredient it had in there that made you think that that, that made it taste that way? No, I didn't even look. You didn't even look. I, I mean, that's kind of the problem with a lot of, you know, the stuff here, but the stuff in any store that is that's in a jar or in a box. There are so many ingredients and often it could just be one or two things that are really contributing to that bad flavor. It says it's made with a mix of pumpkin puree, pumpkin spice, almond butter, and rolled oats. But I don't know. That's it? No, it's got to have some sort of- It could um, be the pumpkin butter. You mean the pumpkin puree or oh, the almond butter? Almond butter. It's mm-hmm. got to have some type of, I can't find what else is in it. Oh, o- wait. Often a little sp- a spice can change, even if it's towards the end of the ingredients, can yeah. really change it. So it says it has water in it too. So- I- Usually when I make overnight oats, I'm using almond milk and Greek yogurt with it. This just has water, pumpkin puree, oh, dates, rolled oats, almond butter, cinnamon, sea salt, and nutmeg, and that's it. Hmm. I don't know. It was just something maybe about- Maybe you're going to give it another shot or not? I would maybe try their regular overnight oats. It was just something that I, I didn't I didn't enjoy this one. Why are you buying it though? If you Overnight oats are the easiest thing to make, right? Yeah. You just take oats. Because it's pumpkin. But it said you just, pumpkin. Can't you just mix in pumpkin spice and make your own pumpkin, pumpkin spice overnight oats? Yeah, I guess I could. And- Am I insulting your cooking ability because I'm telling you why are you buying overnight oats? No, okay. you're not. I bought it because I was having fun. Chopping. Yeah, you're having fun. That's This is what so, happens. Yeah. So in fact, you just gave me an idea because I could use my own overnight oat recipe and I could use the next ingredient that I was going to talk about from Trader Joe's okay. in there. And that's pumpkin butter. That's so the I pumpkin butter. That I could do that, add some of like that pumpkin spice mix and make my own pumpkin overnight oats. But the pumpkin butter, I actually have been buying this for years. I love it. It's good on top of toast. It's good on a scone. Um, We actually use it. I don't know if you remember. This is from a long time ago. One of the drinks on the Sip and Feast website is a pumpkin mule. And we use the Trader Joe's pumpkin butter in that recipe. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah, I don't remember. There's uh, 400 and I think 50 recipes on the site now or some crazy amount Mm -hmm. it's getting very hard to remember everything yeah yeah yeah, it's in that one i do remember about specifically about the pumpkin butter it's extremely dark when you open it up it it looks like almost like black right it's like it's not black it's like almost like a deep orange deep orange so i'm wondering how do you make pumpkin butter you're not just mixing butter and pumpkin puree together. I don't know if there even is any butter in oh, okay. it, to be honest. Yeah, you're probably right. There yeah. probably isn't. It's probably like extremely reduced. It's like a concentrated. Ultra concentrated mm-hmm. pumpkin puree, probably yeah. with some spices. Yep. I'm guessing. That's what it tastes like to me. Yeah, it's the process of uh, reducing it down. That's right. In fact, it's actually really good with butter on toast. So yeah, if you do I do toast, remember that. a little bit of like the Kerrygold. And Carrie some, Gold. And then she, Carrie Gold, butter. where sponsor us. She keeps talking about you well, every I, episode. I love I love them for years and years and years. So Yeah, no, I Carrie Gold is good butter. Mm-hmm. It is. Yeah. yeah. Okay. The pumpkin kringle. Ooh. Trader Joe's usually carries 
some type of Kringle. I think in the, the Christmas season. I love that word, Kringle. Kringle, yeah. In the Christmas season, they usually have a, a special one too, which is escaping me right now. But year round, they'll you can usually find their almond Kringle there. Mm. But around this time of year, they'll sell a pumpkin Kringle. Now, is that Trader Joe's? That's not. I feel like this is one item that they are not making. They're not making it. Yeah. They're importing it from... Um, a bakery in Racine, Wisconsin. Yep. I realize they don't make any of their products and a few people uh, saw a fit to correct me that I was saying I love Kirkland paper towels and they were like, Kirkland doesn't make paper towels. I realize that. These stores are having brands, the brands, it could be any, I mean, I even heard that Kirkland's um, coffee often is Starbucks coffee, just rebranded with the Kirkland label. So yeah, it's probably Bounty or whoever else is in the paper towel business. They're probably the ones making those Kirkland, but those Kirkland ones are have a higher spec. So that's the thing. Costco's specifying we want a we want a more premium product than your other products. So this one too, Trader Joe's. Obviously, I know none of their products are made by them. But th in this respect, I guess the deal with uh, this Kringle maker, the Kringle maker in Racing, Wisconsin, was probably like, we want our name on there too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which is it's a little, got their name on which it. is a little different than anything else in Trader Joe's, from from as far as I can remember. For the most part, yeah. Yeah, that must be a huge bakery because that bakery is making. Again, they were in Minnesota, but the Kringles are available here too. So mm -hmm. how how big is that bakery that they're able to make, they're able to furnish Kringles for 500 Trader Joe's yeah. stores? Maybe that's most of their business. Well, maybe you have a Trader Joe's in another state besides the two that we've been to that doesn't have these Kringles. Mm -hmm. Remember that cake that- um, The king cake? Remember the king cake that Brant, if you're listening, Brant, uh, a patron, longtime patron, Brant and Trish, they sent- uh, Tara, you know, uh, uh, like they sent our whole family these king cakes from a New Orleans bakery. Mm -hmm. And they're the ones that have the little baby Jesus inside of them. Yeah, they're for, um, are they for Mar Mardi Gras? I, I think can't remember for when... Mardi Gras. I'm not positive here. I wonder if the Trader Joe's around that area of the country have those king cakes inside of them. Maybe. You know, so it might be something like that. Yeah. Well, let us know if you have products that you think are specific to where you are in the country that we haven't heard of. And maybe you haven't heard of this Kringle, mm -hmm. but if you have access to it and you haven't bought one yet, what the heck is wrong with you? It's probably the best thing in Trader Joe's. It is really good. I was going to say I the pumpkin one, while it is good and I do enjoy pumpkin flavored things, I am partial to the almond Kringle. I think it's far superior. It's almond pumpkin. paste, right? Yeah. Almond paste is such a unique ingredient. We use it in a recipe, I know. Pignoli cookies? Oh, the pignoli cookies. And that was, when we put that recipe out, it's an expensive cookies for people to make because the paste alone. The paste is expensive and pignoli are very expensive. It's a holiday cookie. And in a, if you go to an Italian bakery, they will often sell those cookies for 30 to $40 a pound. Yeah, yep. They have to spend a lot of money on those raw ingredients too. Mm -hmm. That's true. All right, let's move on to your next one. Okay, the next one I have, and I you just had this the other night, we all did, is the pumpkin ice cream. Yes, what the did, pumpkin ice cream. What did, what did you think of the pumpkin ice cream before I- Big thumbs down. And why? It doesn't taste like pumpkin. It tastes well, like nutmeg. Okay. It, uh, not, not nutmeg, it tastes like eggnog. Yeah. It was eggnog ice cream. Yeah. Now, if they called it eggnog ice cream, it would have been a really good ice cream. I agree. I think they went a little heavy on the nutmeg. And it's not just the batch we got. Never go heavy on the nutmeg. Yeah, it's not just the, it's not just the batch. <laughs> it's not just the batch we got because every year it tastes like eggnog. It doesn't taste, it, to me, it doesn't taste like pumpkin, but is it still good? Did you still eat an entire bowl of it? Yes, you did. What are you talking about an entire bowl? First of all, this is what I'm gonna talk about sizing with Trader Joe's. So they have the oddest, oddest sizing. So it was, I'm, I'm such a moron here. It was, it was it's uh, the size of like two Ben and Jerry's. Yeah, it's two Ben and Jerry's. So Ben and Jerry's are pints. So essentially what you're buying in Trader Joe's is a quart. Yeah, so you have I to guess. buy, you know, if you go to a supermarket, ice cream always comes in a half gallon container. Not always. It never comes. I've never seen it in a quart like that. That's like a Trader Joe's sizing. I think there are some brands that sell it like that. But you know, yeah, you're looking at it and you're like, ah, oh, this is good, but 
you know, you sit down there with your family of four and you're eating the whole thing. And then you're not even, especially if you're known to eat a whole pint of Ben and Jerry's, you're, you know, you think you kind of got gypped because you're like, I needed two of those Trader Joe's. <laughs> not that we eat a pint each of Ben and Jerry's all no. the time. Right, Tara? We don't do that no. ever. No. No, no, no. Well, you do. I do sometimes. Yeah. Okay. What's my favorite? Pen and Jerry's? Fish food. By far. Yeah. Fish food is the best one. In the same vein as the pumpkin ice cream, but it's a little bit different. It's the hold the cone, the mini cones, and they make a pumpkin ginger hold the cone. I think it's the same ice cream. But it works in this. But in it, these. I think it's got like a maple coating on the outside yeah. like a shell on the outside of where the ice cream is and it's really good and it's like a two biter or one biter depending on they're good i give a big thumbs up for these mm-hmm. so if tara's right it's the same ice cream it works for these and i'm excited for the hol- for like the christmas holidays because they make a peppermint oh hold, yeah hold the cone and those are really good that's what's great about trader joe's they're gonna clear this pumpkin stuff out in a couple weeks and then be on to the next thing mm-hmm the next one on my list is my favorite. So I saved that for last because I think that the next few ones we'll mention will just be like a quick yeah. honorable mentions. But this is the pumpkin brioche bread and it is fantastic. I buy it. Sometimes I'll buy like two or three loaves because it's that whole scarcity mindset. I know that it might not be there the next time I go to Trader Joe's. And I get it because the kids... Love it. James likes it, just a slice of it with some butter in the morning before he goes to the bus stop. It's really, really good to use to make French toast. Yeah, it's good. Really good. The way that the kids love it the most, though, they get excited when I ask them if they want it, is a toad in the hole. So where you cut out like a little circle from the center of the bread, butter both sides of the bread, lightly cook it in some butter like you would a French toast, but you add an egg to the center of it and let the egg cook. And then the egg is over easy. You put a little bit of maple syrup on it and you have like the whole sweet savory mm. thing going on. And they love it. It's probably one of their favorite things. So they get excited for this time of year because they know that the pumpkin brioche bread is going to be coming to the house. Yeah, I'm a big fan. So I have nothing bad to say about that one. Mm-hmm. What's your honorable mentions? So quickly, what about that cinnamon bread? Is that on so your? So I okay. did want to. I right. did want to mention yeah. that. So in talking about bread, there, this is the first year I've ever seen this. I don't know if it's new, but it was new for me. It was the apple streusel bread, mm, which that was, was good. It was really good, but I would almost say that that's more like a dessert than a bread. Like I felt like that needed to be warmed with like a scoop of vanilla ice cream. It kind of reminds me of that cinnamon raisin bread. It does, but this was far sweeter. This reminded me of like a dry bread pudding. Yeah, it was good. Yeah. Okay, so honorable mentions I have. Pumpkin coffee, not bad. I'm not a fan of that at all. You have it. It's in the closet right now and way too herb, spicy, whatever. It is spicy, but there is no... If you like like a pumpkin spice latte, but you don't like the sugar, you can get this pumpkin coffee from Trader Joe's and it doesn't have any sugar in it. It just has all like the pumpkin spice, like the cinnamon and- You know what I would do if, if that's what people like and mm-hmm. they don't want the sugar? I would just simply make coffee and then just put a little bit of pumpkin spice when you put your cream in. That, that I think is a better alternative than that. That was a little, I didn't like that at all. You could also, when you're brewing your coffee and you have the, the grinds there, you could add, before you put it in the water, you could add like a little shake of cinnamon and a yeah. little shake and you could like, it could filter through. That's another thing. Yeah. Instead of adding it straight into the, your coffee once it's made. Um, the pumpkin cereal bar, the Trader Joe's always makes these these cereal bars. It's called like this whatever walked into a bar. Yeah. So it's this pumpkin walks into a bar. Those are good. The pumpkin granola bark really good to just like kind of snack on as like a somewhat healthy-ish snack. Um, the pumpkin Jojo's, which are their sandwich cookies. It's kind of like a twist on an Oreo. Yeah, Those are really good. And the final honorable mention, which you loved last year, I don't know if you remember, the pumpkin spice mini pretzels. You couldn't eat enough of them. Oh, those are delicious. Now, I think I ate too many of them and they started <laughs> to taste bad to me. But no, they are. I think I like them probably more than anybody else. They're you they, did. they're like pretzels. They look white. They're like yeah. white and 
cinnamon, I guess. Yes. Like yeah. sweet. Yeah. But yeah, you you enjoyed those. Yeah. That's my list of fall haul items from Trader Joe's. I'm sure there's more that I missed, but that's it. So that kind of concludes our Trader Joe's pumpkin marathon. I know we missed probably a bunch of them. Leave them down in the comments or send us an email, a comment to podcast at sipandfeast.com. Tara, you have some questions for us right now. Yes. This one comes from Bob. Bob wants to know if mixing olive oil or any oil with butter will prevent the butter from burning. I do that. So Bob, I will always, there's a lot of different recipes this will work for. Say you're doing chicken franchise, which chicken franchise is typically done in butter. If you start with a couple of tablespoons of olive oil, that's kind of safer because what happens is when you put your chicken down, it'll get a little bit, start to get a little bit golden. Then you can add your butter in. I find if you start with the butter right away, you have to be very precise with your heating and know your stove really well, or you might potentially burn it. So I will often mix butter and oil to prevent that problem. Exactly, Bob. Next question. This comes from Deborah. Deborah says she's always wanted more information about good knives. She's a home cook and would like some information on choosing good average kitchen knives and how to take care of them. So Deborah, uh, knives is a huge, huge topic. There's a lot of channels on YouTube that are just devoted to knife reviews. A lot of them are questionable because they're taking money from different sponsors, which, you know, if we ever get us have a sponsor for something like that, we would we would one hundred percent be truthful. But since we don't have any knife sponsors, we did have one in the past, and th that company is we're no longer working with that company ever again. So that's all I'm going to say about that. But the ones I'm talking to you about right now are not sponsors for the channel. One that I like, it's on Amazon. It's the name of the brand is called Mercer. Mercer sells a lot of their knives to culinary schools. So a lot of, if when you go to a culinary school, you're not gonna be, you know, you're not gonna have a Kramer knife. A Kramer is a very expensive knife. You're gonna have a utility knife, a utility chef's knife uh, in that like 15 to $30 price range because they gotta make things inexpensive enough for the students. So these culinary schools buy thousands of these knives. They're great knives. They're low on the Rockwell scale. The Rockwell scale is a scale that's used to measure the hardness of steel. When you have something that's like a Rockwell 57, which is what a Mercer eight inch chef's knife is roughly, you will be able to sharpen that knife easily. You cannot have good knives, any knives, if you don't know how to sharpen. This is a really important thing. Any knife you buy, whether it's a $300 Kramer or a $20 Mercer will need to be sharpened at some point. Now, if you don't feel comfortable learning how to sharpen, Deborah, I would then make sure that you care for your knife well. That will prolong the amount of time before you have to sharpen. But once you need it sharpened, you bring it to a professional sharpener. One thing to keep in mind, I've done this in a bunch of my videos and I'll steal my knife. There is so many people in there writing bad, wrong, completely wrong comments in there. They're saying about you know, that I'm sharpening and I'm doing over that. A steel does not sharpen a knife. A steel simply straightens your knife. If you would take a microscope and look at your knife, you would see the metal, the exact point where the two sides meet. That's, that's what creates the sharpness that cuts something. You would see it would be moving one side or the other. A steel will simply straighten that knife, that microscopic edge, allowing you to get a little bit uh, better cutting experience. A steel works fine when your knives are sharp or have been sharpened, but when you need to remove metal, that's when you have to either sharpen it with diamond stones or ceramic stones or sandpaper, whatever type of stones, or you have to bring it to a place that will do it for you. They will create a new edge, they will remove metal, and then you will then be able to steal your knife until the time again that it needs to be sharpened. Tara, am I making sense here? Am I or am I getting a little too I think in it the makes, weeds? No, I think it makes sense. I think as you're say, as we're talking through this, this could probably be an entire episode yeah. because there is a lot to know. And I think it is kind of hard to maybe answer Deborah's question in the best way possible in the question segment. What do you? I think that's right. And listen, I just want to say one thing. 
as much as these knives people uh, who have channels dedicated to it are quote unquote an expert, there's one thing that they probably don't do that I've done for a long time. And what is that, Tara? What have I done with knives for a long time? Wood carving? Yeah. So it frustrates me immensely when people tell me I don't know what I'm doing with knives. I All those spoons that are in, in the videos have been hand carved by me, not just with straight knives, but with round knives called hook knives. If you want to actually really test your sharpening ability, try to sharpen a round knife. So a round knife is the knife looks like a hook. That's what allows you to carve the inside of the bowl of the spoon. So I've been carving for you know probably 15 years. Now I haven't done it in a few years, but during that time, I became an expert sharpener. And the knives that I was using, the steel that I was using on my carving knives is better than any steel that's used on any any cooking knife. And a lot of times, just simply going back to the cooking knives, you're better off with the not expensive knives and the not high-end steel. The high-end steel will be often be Japanese knives that will be a Rockwell 63. Some of them go up to 67. The higher that number goes, the harder that metal is to sharpen, and it's brittle. If you drop a Japanese knife that's an R67, it's going to probably break in half. So it's they need to be babied, those knives. So you're better off with that Mercer or... There's a few other inexpensive brands. Even Henkel makes some 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 inexpensive ones that are kind of like starter knives, Henkel and Wusthof. You're set with those. You just need to learn how to sharpen them and use them properly. Never put them in the dishwasher. When you put it in a dishwasher, no matter where you're putting it, even for the knife spot in your dishwasher, there will be micro movements in the dishwasher. The knife, the sharp edge of the knife will hit and then it will become not sharp and then you'll have to steal it again to straighten it out. I, I hope this all helps. I probably confused you more than I helped you. No, I think it was it was helpful, but I think um, it could definitely be fleshed out further in a full a full podcast. So thanks for tuning in. Leave your comments, questions to podcast at sippingfeast.com. We will see you next time.